Welcome back, everybody, to the NCAA Next Up Dynasty here on NCAA Football 14. We have made it to Bowl Week, and we've got a jam-packed episode today. We'll be revealing the four teams playing for the college football playoff, as voted by all of you guys. We will be revealing all the award winners, including the Heisman Trophy winner, also voted by all of you guys. And then we'll be going over all of the bowl games, excluding the three college football playoff games, which will be in the next episode. All right, let's not waste any more time. Let's meet the four teams participating in the college football playoff. The number one seed got over 50% of the first place vote, and that team is the South Alabama Jaguars. South Alabama went undefeated in the Sun Belt Conference, and for the first time really all season, they're pretty much fully healthy. Star running back Keon Monroe missed most of the season, but he is fully healthy for the college football playoff. They have a great passing game with senior quarterback Kedrick Brown and senior wide receiver Trey Williams. They have plenty of talent on defense, led by All-American cornerback Cardell Simpson. They've only played against one Power 5 team, that being Houston, whom they beat by 30. However, they've dominated everybody on their schedule with the highest point differential in the country, and they have earned this top seed. The number two seed, we've got another group five team, the Middle Tennessee State Blue Raiders. These guys have dealt with their fair share of injuries. Their starting quarterback, Mark Archie, and their number one wide receiver, Nehemiah Dalton Jr., suffered season-ending injuries halfway through the season. But everybody on their roster has done a great job of stepping up. They do have some statement wins here, including beating North Carolina by 31 points. North Carolina, that's when they were fully healthy and ranked into the top 10. Little Tennessee State went undefeated in conference play as well. The number three seed we have is the Georgia Bulldogs, led by the projected number one pick, Clyde Williamson. Georgia finished the season 11-2, winning the SEC Championship game over Oklahoma in unbelievable fashion in the last episode, 46-43. Going into the college football playoff, I think Georgia is the favorite to win it all. If you look at their schedule, they did lose two games earlier in the season, but they have been flawless since week six. Head to toe, they have one of the best rosters in college football, and after appearing in the college football playoff last year, it feels like they have some unfinished business. As for the number four seed, it was very close between three teams, but ultimately, the Michigan Wolverines will be the fourth and final team in the college football playoff. It was very close between Michigan, Oklahoma, and West Virginia. Michigan and West Virginia had nearly identical resumes, and of course, West Virginia defeated Michigan head-to-head -head back in Week 2. I think West Virginia fans have a right to be upset about this, but the rest of Michigan's resume speaks for itself. The Wolverines have not lost since Week 4, going undefeated in conference play. They dominated in the Big Ten Championship, of course, led by maybe the most explosive player in college football, quarterback Bartholomew Blunt. As for the rest of the vote, Oklahoma ended up finishing in fifth with West Virginia in sixth. Other than that, there wasn't really any other team who had much of a shot of getting in. So those are your four playoff teams. South Alabama will play Michigan in the next episode, and Georgia will play against Middle Tennessee State. Let's talk about the awards, starting with the Heisman. And you guys voted Basaru Lee as the Heisman Trophy winner. I fully agree with this. I think he had a fantastic season throwing the football and absolutely deserves this honor despite the fact that his team lost the SEC championship and is not in the college football playoff. The man he lost to, Clyde Williamson, finished in second. Bartholomew Blunt ended up in third. He was the favorite for most of the season but fell off late. Cannon McMullen finished in fourth. What a story he had going into the season as the backup running back. Kate Hutchinson finished in fifth. The game gave him the award, but for our vote, he finished in fifth place. He had a fantastic season of his own. And then Florida running back Elijah Bryant finished in sixth place. He had a fantastic season, but not quite at the level of those top five guys. Let's take a look at all the major award winners. The Heisman Trophy is not the only award Masaru Lee took home, winning the Maxwell and the Walter Camp. Jameer Jefferson won the Bednarik and the Nagurski. The Davy O'Brien Award went to Masaru Lee, so he ended up winning four awards. The Dolk Walker was won by Kana McMullen. Trey Williams won the Boletnikoff. The John Mackey went to Chad Johnson of Penn State. The Outland Award went to Magnus Zimmerman of Notre Dame. The Remington went to Tyshawn Stallings of Virginia. I forgot to put the Lombardi Award on the poll. The three finalists I would have picked include the actual winner, 
Tykeem Rogers. The other two players weren't even on the final poll, those being Roman Horn II and Jordan Ruffin. So I guess let me know in the comments who you think of those three deserves to win. The best linebacker went to Kazavon Kachorian of Clemson, and then Jameer Jefferson won the Jim Thorpe Award. I didn't have a vote for the special teams one, so we'll just go with what the game says. Here's a look at the All-American teams as well. I didn't have a vote for the All-American teams. That would just be a little bit too much, I think. But this is what the game went with. Ultimately, I don't really have any major gripes here. So there you go. Those are the college football playoff teams along with the awards and the All-Americans. Here is the All-Freshman team. Let's now talk about the bowl games. That's going to be what we spend most of today's episode on. The first half of the episode is going to be dedicated to all of these smaller bowls, all of which are going to get like a short 45 to minute segment on each of them. And then the second half of the video will be focusing on the bigger bowl games. I had to be creative with Michigan and Georgia since they're in the playoff. So I'm going to have Oregon play against Notre Dame in the Rose Bowl since there's only a two-team championship in this game. Let's start with the Gildan New Mexico Bowl between two of the more fun teams in the country, Boise State and Arizona. Arizona is led by senior wide receiver Scotty Pickens, who's projected to be a first-round pick. He has a real opportunity to show what he can do on the national stage, and boy, did he deliver. Pickens scored three times in this game, cementing himself as a first-round lock in this year's draft. Arizona quarterback Kareem Kamara had a fantastic day, not just throwing to Scotty Pickens, as Kamara accumulated six all-purpose touchdowns in this one, three of which, as I said, of course, went to this man, Scotty Piggins. The Wildcats would take it home 45-28. to Boise State gave a good fight, but it was not enough to stop Arizona. Kareem Kamara went off. Scotty Piggins, nine catches, 192 yards, and three touchdowns. So with Scotty Piggins' collegiate career now done, he finishes ninth all-time in receptions, Third all-time in receiving yards, only behind Corey Davis and Trevor Inslee. And he finishes tied for fourth in touchdowns. One of the all-time great receiving careers in the history of college football. Again, Boise State gave a good fight, but they could not stop Scotty Piggins at all. We get to the famous Idaho Potato Bowl at the Blue Turf in Boise, Idaho, between Western Michigan and Fresno State. These teams played against each other earlier in the season, so it's a rematch. Both teams have great run games, and both rushing units produced. Alec Bostic had a nice game for Fresno State, and then Wolf Eatonson produced at a high level for Western Michigan. But ultimately, the deciding factor was the struggles of Western Michigan quarterback Caillou Vogelson. He threw three interceptions, all three of which were caught by senior defensive back Paulie Coleman, who finishes with a FBS high 13 interceptions on the season. A great performance here from Coleman, elevating his already pretty high draft stock. Now he's being looked at as a possible day two selection after his ridiculous breakout season. Fresno State wins in a defensive battle 17 to 16. Both passing games really struggled. Both teams really leaned on the run. And obviously Paulie Coleman, well, he's him. Rough one for Kyle Vogel sawing 10 for 24, three interceptions, just not his day. We get to the point set a bowl in San Diego. A home game, pretty much, for the San Diego State Aztecs as they face off against the University of Virginia. San Diego State is led by their senior tight end, Malachi James, who was projected to be a first-round pick in this year's draft. And James performed pretty well, scoring a touchdown, but ultimately, San Diego State's run defense could not stop the Virginia offense. Their running back, Sarion Davis-Mills, ran for three touchdowns in this game, ultimately leading Virginia to the win, 31-27. Virginia started the season off really well. They kind of cooled off as the season went along, but overall, a pretty solid season for the Cavaliers as they finish 7-6, as does San Diego State. It was good to see Malachi James perform well in his final collegiate game, cementing himself as a first-round pick with five catches for 51 yards and a touchdown. But again, Sarion Davis-Mills was ultimately the star with 113 yards and three touchdowns. We have the Beef O'Brady's Bowl between Boston College and Idaho. Idaho won a number of really big games this year, kind of out of nowhere. Specifically, the Auburn won pretty late in the season. We got a look at their senior tight end, Wyatt Swanson, who was a finalist for the John Mackey Award. He scored a touchdown, but Boston College's offense was a little bit too much for the Idaho defense to handle. Rudolph Rousseau, the senior quarterback, had a few really good throws, including that one to wide receiver Seth Elgore and another one to the running back Thomas. 
Boston College would take this one home 31-14. to Boston College was led by their offense throughout the season, and fittingly, it's the offense who really produces here in their final game, although the defense was quite solid as well. We didn't even talk about Jeremiah Schofield. He had 147 yards and two touchdowns as well. We have the New Orleans Bowl in the Mercedes-Benz Superdome between Nebraska and Texas State. On paper, I feel this game is a little bit lopsided. I think Nebraska is certainly the better team, and well, they showed it early and often. Senior quarterback Jeff McCoy had a great performance, including this awesome throw for fellow senior Lincoln Presley in the back of the end zone for a touchdown. Jeff McCoy was a touchdown machine in this game. He had another passing touchdown here. Ridiculous catch by the receiver. And then McCoy later answered with a rushing touchdown as the Cornhuskers take it home 42-31. to Good win for Nebraska as both teams finish 7-6. and six. I'm very curious to see how Nebraska is going to do next season with a new starting quarterback, of course, playing in a really good Big Ten conference. McCoy finished with five all-purpose touchdowns, Lincoln Presley 162 yards in the air. Next up, we've got the Las Vegas Mako Bowl in, well, Las Vegas, between Washington and Air Force. Air Force is coming off the Mountain West Championship victory, and sure enough, this ended up being a really fun game. Air Force is led by their quarterback, Danny White, known for his passing ability, but he had an awesome touchdown there on the ground. Washington was able to tie it late with a beautiful throw from junior quarterback Keontae Jordan over to Anthony Kendrickson in the back of the end zone. That would ultimately lead to this game going into overtime. Air Force would start with the ball as Danny White would be picked off in the end zone by Anthony Greco. Washington now with an easy opportunity to win the game, and that they would do as Keontae Jordan would connect short with Pitts for the game-winning touchdown. Washington wins 27 21. An unfortunate end to the season for Air Force and Danny White, whose final collegiate pass ends up being an interception. As for Washington, Keontae Jordan had a very productive day. He did throw two interceptions, but he was quite solid. Anthony Kendrickson was great as well. Now we have the Hawaii Bowl featuring Hawaii, who just lost the Mountain West Championship to Air Force. They're going up against the Golden Panthers of Florida International University. They are led by quarterback Bronson Kluderman, the brother of Wisconsin quarterback Torrin Kluderman. As Bronson threw two touchdowns in this game, FIU was able to get the win over Hawaii 21-13. Hawaii finishes their season 7-7. Seven and seven. Good performance here from FIU, who I think could have had a bigger season had they not shared a conference with Middle Tennessee State, who of course is going into the college football playoff. FIU finishes their season 7-6. and six. Senior QB Teddy Blocky was not all that impressive for Hawaii in his final game with the team. And then Kluderman was really solid throwing for two touchdowns, adding 100 rushing yards as well. Now we have the Little Caesars Pizza Bowl at Ford Field in Detroit, Michigan, home of the Lions as Iowa faces off against Akron. The Akron Zips are without their starting quarterback Carson Young today. But that did not stop their offense from going nuclear. The backup quarterback, Christopher Morales, threw four touchdowns in this game as the Zips upset Iowa 41-21. to I'm sure Zippy the Kangaroo had a pretty fun time doing his TikToks in the end zone as we get a close look at him here. I don't think Zippy the Kangaroo is the type of guy you want to mess with. And, well, I think it's fair to say Iowa did not mess with him today. The Hawkeyes finished their season under 500 at 6 and 7. Certainly a letdown season for Iowa who had big expectations going into the season, but they lost too many bad losses to not so great teams. Akron finishes 9 and 4 and they have expectations as one of the favorites in the MAC conference going into next season. Next up we've got the Military Bowl. It is a snowy one here as Army faces off against Toledo. This is supposed to be Army's thing, obviously, you know, the military bowl and all that. And Army did look pretty solid early on in this game. Amita Coney, the junior quarterback, threw a couple of touchdowns today. The tight end, Carlito Azusa, had a very good performance for Army. But ultimately, Toledo ended up getting the upset here, 27-21. Very solid performance from the quarterback, Flowers, as he connects with a nice touchdown here over to his tight end, Mitchell. Good win for Toledo. They finished 7-6. Army also finishes 7-6 and six, despite a pretty solid performance from Amita Coney and, of course, Carlito Azusa, who was able to score twice. Toledo's led by their run game, and they actually didn't even run the ball that well, which is the biggest surprise of this game. 
Next up, we got the Holiday Bowl back in San Diego Stadium. Pretty much a home game for the Cal Golden Bears. A lot of yellow, a lot of Cal blue. So Duke is pretty much the away team here, but that did not stop the Blue Devils from absolutely dominating this game. Quarterback Justin Tucker, only a sophomore, really looked good in this game for Duke. He had a couple of touchdowns in this one. Duke's top receivers, Jabari Kruger and Caden Reed, both performed at a high level in this one. Going into the season, Duke was projected to finish dead last in the ACC. And I said they are a real sleeper team to watch out for. And sure enough, they finished the season 8-5. I was right about Duke being a legitimately good team, led by head coach Keith Fleming. As for a Cal, they did not throw the ball well. Their run game, which is normally really good, was not great. Hence why they ultimately got blown out 36-13. to Cal had big expectations this season, and they finished under 500 at 6-7. Next up, we got the Belk Bowl between North Carolina and Texas A&M. Both of these teams were ranked in the top 10 at one point early in the season, but both teams kind of disappointed once the big expectations hit them. Here at the Bank of America Stadium, home of the Carolina Panthers, this ended up being a really exciting offensive game, one of the more fun bowl matchups of the season. Texas A&M sophomore quarterback Luca Franco had one of his better games of the year, connecting with a couple of touchdowns to freshman wide receiver Quinn Crew. The great thing about Texas A&M is unless all of their key offensive players declare for the draft, none of them are seniors, so they are all expected to be back next year. However, I can't really talk positively about their defense. Jameer Stewart threw six touchdowns today for North Carolina, and the Tar Heels would win 49-31. Jameer Stewart, of course, is the backup. Graham Fisher suffered a season-ending injury earlier in the season, and Jameer Stewart did a very serviceable job as the backup quarterback. I'm curious to see if he'll get interest in the transfer portal. He, as I said, threw for six touchdowns in this matchup. And again, just like Texas A&M, UNC is going to have most of their offense back next year. Star running back Igby Prince will be gone. He's a senior. But everybody else should return. Shamir Kaysan, Rambo Lumpkins, and Obadiah Jackson will all probably be back next year with their starting quarterback, Graham Fisher. Next up, we have the BBVA Compass Bowl in Birmingham, Alabama, as UCLA takes on Navy. Navy lost the Army-Navy game. They lost their conference championship. So I feel like Navy's going to have a little sense of urgency today, and it certainly looked like they really went after this game. Torian Wilson scored twice for the midshipmen, and Navy was able to win this one 31-17 over the Bruins, who finished their first season in the Big Ten with a record of 6-7. Not a great season for UCLA, especially considering USC was way better than them, but you still have to commend UCLA for making a bowl game in their first season in the new conference, despite only going 3-6 in conference play. Both teams really struggled to throw the ball in this matchup. Overall, pretty ugly football game. Next up, we have the Independence Bowl between USF and Pitt. Pitt appears to be the better team on paper. They were the favorite going into this game, but they clearly did not know what hit them. The University of South Florida ended up scoring 50 in this game, beating Pitt 50-24. to Sophomore quarterback Donovan Ferguson had a really big performance. I'm very high on Donovan Ferguson. I think he's one of the best Group 5 quarterbacks in the country. Assuming he is back next year at USF, Expect the Bulls to have big expectations next year as one of the favorites in the American Athletic Conference. As for the Panthers, Jonah Molewire had an okay game, his final performance as a Panther before entering the NFL. Curious to see where he ends up going. Overall, a pretty disappointing season for Pitt as they only finished 7-6 and six after being ranked in the top 15 to open up the season. All right, next up, we have the Russell Athletic Bowl between UConn and Clemson. I think Clemson absolutely should have gotten a New Year's Six Bowl game, but instead they have to play UConn for Lord knows what reason. Quarterback Kate Hutchinson certainly looked the part today. He threw for four touchdowns, three of which were caught by junior wide receiver Xavion Mayo. Mayo is expected to be a big breakout candidate next year in the Clemson offense. I'm excited to see what he can do. This could be the final game as a Clemson Tiger for Cade Hutchinson. He is eligible for the NFL draft as a redshirt junior. I think Hutchinson would be a first-round pick if he declared. However, his camp is suggesting that he may stay in school for another season. So that'll be a very interesting storyline as we go into the draft. Clemson only won the game by 14. I will say UConn 
played competitively, but Kate Hutchinson is a little bit too good. The biggest surprise in this game was Clemson's number one receiver, John Vincent, who has been injured for a little while. He played today, but he did not catch a single pass. As for UConn, I think they covered the spread. They didn't get blown out, which is good. They finished the season 8-5. and five. Curious to see if they'll get any invites to a Power 5 conference next year. Michigan State taking on Vanderbilt in the Meineke Car Killer Bowl. Michigan State is led by their senior quarterback, Nathan Bruins, who is one of the highest leading passers in college football. He had a great throw early in this game for a touchdown to junior running back Joshua Calico. However, on the following possession, Bruins would be sacked and taken out of the game with an injury. The backup quarterback did pretty solid, including this awesome throw for sophomore wide receiver A. John Wiggins. But a late second half comeback from Vanderbilt would propel the Commodores to victory. We haven't really talked about Vanderbilt too much this season. They're led by a senior quarterback, Michael Roach, who very quietly had a really good season for the Commodores. Despite being in a very good SEC conference, Vanderbilt finishes the season over 500 as they beat Michigan State 29-26. to I'm a little bit concerned for Michigan State's quarterback, Nathan Bruins. He had a fantastic season throwing the football. He looked good early today, but he's a very slender player. 6'2", 160 pounds. We saw him taken out of the game with an injury. So I'm very curious about his durability entering the NFL. But overall, I do think Bruins' stock went up based on his performances throughout the season. Next up, we've got the Armed Forces Bowl between UAB and UNLV. The University of Alabama Birmingham is one of the red-hot teams in the American Athletic Conference. They've performed very well over the past month or so, and they had another pretty good performance today. They didn't blow out UNLV, but they won comfortably 24-14. The starting quarterback, Robinson, had a couple nice touchdowns in this one, ultimately propelling UAB to a double-digit win season as they finished the year 10-3. As for UNLV, they will finish 8-5. Solid performance from uh, veteran wide receiver John Hector, but ultimately that was not enough to get the job done and win the game. Good performance by UAB. Overall, a good season for them as well, finishing 10-3. One of the most interesting bowl games of this entire season was the Fight Hunger Bowl between Tulane and Colorado. Colorado is led by true freshman quarterback Zion Mayo, who finished as a freshman All-American. He had a ridiculous touchdown pass here, but ultimately got injured on that play, ending his game. So Colorado is going to be without their starting quarterback for the remainder of this contest. As for Tulane, same story. Senior QB David Burks had an awesome touchdown throw here, but he would be taken out of the game. So now both teams are down to their backup quarterbacks. And it was really fun seeing these two backups perform at a very high level on offense. Ultimately, Tulane was able to get the last laugh. This late touchdown propelled the green wave to the victory, 38-31. Again, one of the most interesting bowl games of the entire bowl cycle. Certainly not the end to David Burks' collegiate career that he had hoped for, being, you know, injured and all that. As for Colorado, they're going to be a very interesting team next season. I'm excited to see if Zion Mayo can take a leap as a sophomore in Season 2 of the series. Next up, we've got the Valero Alamo Bowl between the runners-up in the Big 12, Baylor, and the runners-up in the Pac-12, Arizona State. I think Baylor is pretty pissed off after getting embarrassed in the Big 12 championship by West Virginia. So they decided to take their anger out on the Sun Devils. Forrest Holloway has had a disappointing freshman season at quarterback, but he did have an awesome throw here, maybe his best of the season, for a touchdown to Walton Moran. Baylor is led by their running back, Isaac Stokes. He had a great final collegiate game going for 180 yards and two touchdowns. Baylor wins big, 31-6. to a surprisingly quiet game for junior wide receiver Hector Estrada III, who only had one catch for nine yards. Estrada has been one of the most underrated receivers in the country this year, finishing with 14 touchdowns and over 1,000 yards. Overall, a good win for Baylor. Pretty solid season for the Bears, who finished 9-5. and five. Next up, we've got the GoDaddy.com Bowl between the champions of the MAC Conference, Ohio, and the University of Louisiana, Monroe. Ohio was the heavy favorite going into this game. However, they were shocked to get absolutely blown out by the Warhawks of Louisiana Monroe. UL Monroe just completely ran it down Ohio's throats, and the Bobcats had no answer at all. 38-6, your final. A huge statement win for UL Monroe. 
Ohio actually went up in the ranking. I have no idea how that makes sense. Maybe I have to simulate another week and then they'll fix the rankings. I don't know. Next up, we've got TCU facing all against the defending national champion, the Minnesota Golden Gophers in the Buffalo Wild Wings Bowl here at Arizona State's Stadium. This was one of the best games of the entire bowl cycle. Minnesota is, of course, led by their run game and senior running back Rocket Reddick, who made his voice and, I guess, legs heard in his final collegiate game with this awesome run for a touchdown. However, it was TCU who got the last laugh. Sophomore quarterback Cade Brown had a really good performance. The Horn Frogs were one of just four teams in the Big 12 Conference to finish over 500. That being along with Baylor and then UCF and West Virginia, both of whom are playing in New Year's Six Bowl games. TCU wins this one by the final score of 42 to 35. Rocket Reddick was great today for Minnesota, and he was great throughout the entire season, but it does feel like a disappointing season for the Golden Gophers after winning the national championship just a season ago. Next up, we got the Music City here in Nashville. Of course, this series ties into our Titans franchise, so that's fitting. We've got Texas and Miami, two teams who have been kind of disappointing this season, but have played better down the stretch. We got to see Benedict Sparrow launch a nuke here for D8 in Washington. Washington was pegged as one of the favorites for the Bletnikoff Award early in the season. Although he was a little bit disappointing, it was good to see him make some nice plays today. Miami's offense was great as well. Scooty Young Jr. had an awesome throw here for the senior wide receiver Rico Ricard, but ultimately a late interception by the Miami defense. Safety J.D. Boyd at the back of the end zone would lead the Hurricanes to the victory over Texas. And I think Zippy the Kangaroo has some competition for his mascot TikToking, as the Miami mascot has some good dance moves as well. The Hurricanes win it 24 to 21. Scooty Young Jr. had a pretty solid day, although he was picked off twice. Benedict Sparrow, also no stranger to the interception. He was intercepted three times today. Sparrow threw a lot of interceptions this season. It was good to see D.A. in Washington have a couple of nice plays, but overall pretty disappointing end to the season for Texas. Next up, we've got the Hyundai Sun Bowl between Washington State and Syracuse. It's been a very up and down season for the Orange, who've had a lot of good and a lot of bad. Early on, we saw the good from Romano Fargnoli, who had an awesome throw here in the end zone for Allen, who would get the touchdown. But Syracuse's defense really struggled today. Senior quarterback Brian Bush had a great game in the air for the Washington State Cougars throwing a couple really nice touchdowns in this game. He was also very busy on the ground as well. I mean, look at this throw. Just remarkable stuff. One of the best throws of all of the ball games this year. Washington State takes it home over the Orange, 42-21. to Good end of the season here for the Cougars, who finished 7-6. and six. As for Syracuse, they finished 6-7. and seven. Romano Fargnoli with a little bit of everything. Three touchdowns, but he also threw four interceptions. Fargnoli entered the season as a Heisman hopeful. Certainly didn't look like a Heisman contender throughout most of the season. Next up, we've got the Liberty Bowl between Tennessee and Western Kentucky. Tennessee was dominant through the first half of the season until sophomore quarterback Benjamin McKenzie suffered an injury. But McKenzie is back. He made sure to play this game for the Vols, and he looked pretty good, going 18-30, of throwing two touchdowns, including this one to the senior David Nunez, and another one shortly after to the true freshman Skeeter Darlington. McKenzie was not perfect. He got picked off twice, but overall I thought he was pretty good today. However, Western Kentucky really stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Tennessee the entire game. Wide receiver Zion McKegee had a great game for the Hilltoppers as he scored twice, the second of which would tie the game late in the fourth quarter and bring us to overtime. Western Kentucky would open up with the ball in the overtime period as the quarterback Jones would drop back to throw it and he would ultimately be sacked on this play. After not being able to do anything on third down, they would have to kick a long field goal. Kick is up and it is wide to the right. No good. Tennessee now with an opportunity to win the game, and that they would do. The senior running back, Chris Johnson, on his final collegiate snap, gets the game-winning touchdown, 37-31, your final Tennessee takes it home. Certainly an up-and-down season for Tennessee, who was great the first half of the season, but again, once Benjamin McKenzie got hurt, it kind of went downhill. 
McKenzie did perform pretty well in this game, minus the two interceptions. If he doesn't declare for the draft, I'm really curious to see what Tennessee's expectations look like going into next season, because when McKenzie was healthy, I don't think Tennessee lost a single game this year. Next up, we've got the Heart of Dallas Bowl, pretty much a home game for Rice, as the Rutgers Scarlet Knights travel in here to face off against them. Rutgers, just like Duke, is another team who I pegged as a sleeper going into the season, and I couldn't have been more right about. DR Antoine had another great game on the ground as one of the most explosive running backs in college football, but Rice's run game was also really good. Their backup running back, Alex Sanders, scored it twice in this one, ultimately leading Rice to the upset, 38-24, I guess that's why you shouldn't have Texas teams play in the Dallas Bowl, but I don't know. That's just me. Quiet game for Johans Franz. He's been pretty good throughout the season, but wasn't outstanding today. He was actually outperformed by Rice's quarterback, Marcus Kane, who had a great game in the air. Next up, we've got the Gator Bowl between Auburn and USC. We've now made it to the new calendar year. We're getting pretty close to the New Year's Six Bowls, and it seems like all of the bowl games left are between pretty good teams, such as Auburn and USC. Auburn played very well in the first half. Sidney McDonald had a couple really nice touchdown throws to A.J. Redico, and Auburn led big going into halftime. But if there's one thing we've learned about this Auburn team throughout the season... They do not play a consistent 60 minutes of football, and that was the case again as they let the pedal off the metal in the second half. Anthony Raymond had a great game on the ground for USC. He really stole the show. USC's starting running back, Patrick Dauphrend, was out for this game with broken ribs, and man, Anthony Raymond did not disappoint. Auburn was able to recover an onside kick late, and they still won the game, but man, when is Auburn going to play a consistent game from start to finish? Scotty Kimbrell was pretty solid, much better than his last game against Notre Dame, in which he was picked off five times. Good to see Anthony Raymond play well. He's probably going to be the starting running back next year with Patrick Dauphrend going into the NFL. Sidney McDonald was very good, as was A.J. Redico. Redico had a great season, certainly improved his draft stock today. Oklahoma in the Capital One Bowl against Wisconsin. Why Oklahoma isn't in one of the Super Big Bowl games? I have no idea. I would have loved to have watched a full game of Oklahoma again, but I guess the college football gods disagree, and they're putting them up against a much inferior opponent in Wisconsin. Wisconsin's a talented team, but they were no match for the Sooners today. The Heisman Trophy winner, Masaru Lee, had a great performance today, throwing for three touchdowns, two of which were caught by his tight end, senior Muhammad McBride. Bryce Berry, the junior receiver, had a great game. Senior wideout Kaysom Bruyette also played well for the Sooners. He'll probably be the top receiver off the board. And a late rushing touchdown by Masaru Lee was able to put Oklahoma in the 50s as they blew out Wisconsin 51-14. to Again, I wish we got to see Oklahoma in one of the bigger bowl games, but I guess beggars be choosers. Uh, Wisconsin had an interesting strategy with quarterback. They kind of let Torin Kluderman go to the bench in the second half. I think they just wanted to test out some of their other guys who they might start next year. And both of the backups played horribly. So hopefully for Wisconsin, they have somebody different start, whether it's a true freshman or a transfer or someone else. They're probably going to miss Torin Kluderman next year because he was pretty good this season. The final non-New Year's Six Bowl is the Outback Bowl between Florida and and Ohio State here at Raymond James Stadium, home of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Despite being unranked, I think Florida is one of the most talented teams in the country, and boy, did they show it today. Marco Brunley was picked off three times, twice of which were by senior corner Anthony Ryder Strobel. He took that one to the house for a pick six. Ryder Strobel has been injured for most of the last two seasons, so it was great to see him not only play today, but play well. Florida's offense was very solid. Genesis Moon had a good game at quarterback. And, of course, Elijah Bryant out of the backfield had a very strong performance scoring twice as the Gators would blow out the Buckeyes 34-10. Florida really got screwed over by, you know, the SEC being so good this year. I think if Florida was in the Big Ten, they would be a double-digit win team. As for Ohio State, they finished the season 9-4. The Buckeyes started the year off getting a lot of close wins. They just looked fraudulent, and clearly that was the case. Not a bad season for Ohio State, but not a great one either. As for Florida, I hope they finish the season in the top 25 because they are easily one of the 25 best teams in college football. Their defense was so good today. Zyrus Okpoko Jr., four TFLs, two sacks. He's going to be the top defensive player off the board in this year's class. Neville Franklin's going to be a first-rounder. Anthony Ryder-Strobel's really good. 
Chukwubukum, the left tackle. He's going to be a first rounder. Florida is such a talented team. All right, let's get to the New Year's Six Bowls. We're going to be watching these games and putting more emphasis on them, starting with the Peach Bowl between Alabama and Florida State. Both of these teams emphasize their offenses by running the football. Bryson Byrne, the Alabama quarterback, had a very efficient season, but I do feel like he didn't quite live up to my expectations. Kyle McCloskey and Quincy Murphy really carried the offense for most of this season, and I wish Alabama utilized their star receivers, Jaden Wilson-Miller, Khalil Hassan, and Emeka Uwuzie a little bit more. The Tide do have a great defense, led by Marcus Moore, who is the top projected corner in this year's draft. Florida State's a very similar team. They've got a young quarterback in Jacob King, but these guys are a run-first team. Brody Kluby, the junior running back, is one of the best players at his position in college football. And then Florida State as well, loaded with talent on the defensive side of the ball. Flo Quart Goen is a phenomenal player. Duck Chambers, Ebenezer Rosen, and of course Seattle Jackson, the second projected corner in this year's draft class, only behind Marcus Moore of Alabama. Should be a fun one here in the Georgia Dome. Both teams are not too far away from here, so they were able to travel their fans out pretty nicely. Let's start in the first quarter. Nice throw up the middle by Jacob King into the hands of McKelvin Birch, the senior receiver. Florida State would move down the field, ultimately looking to add a field goal. This from, from around 50 yards out is up. It's going to be close, and it is barely good. The Seminoles start on the board with a 3-0 lead. Let's go to the following Florida State possession, third and eight. So far, a defensive battle in this one as King is sacked to the ground by the slot corner, Brandon Turner. Certainly a defensive battle here in the first quarter as Alabama looks to take the lead. Bryson Byrne fakes the handoff, looks to throw it. His pass is intercepted. The true freshman, Derek Thompson, picks it off with blocks. One man to beat. And he is going to take it to the house for a pick six. What a play by the true freshman corner, Derek Thompson, one of the top recruits of this year's class, coming in to make a big play. Alabama's offense needs to respond. Here's Quincy Murphy with room down the field. A huge run for the junior Murphy as he gets around 60. Alabama's offense needed a spark, and boy, they got it. First and goal, back to Murphy. He is in for a touchdown. Quincy Murphy and Kyle McCloskey is such a dangerous running back duo. Both of them are juniors, both expected to be back next season as it's now 10-7. Florida State with it here in the second quarter, third and goal. King is slammed to the turf again. Benny Ulikowski this time is the one with the sack. The Seminoles would add a field goal, so it is now 13-7 as we go to the following Alabama possession. Second and 10, Bryson Byrne up the middle with a strike to Cooper Jensen, who has popped by the defense. Alabama would tack on a field goal. It's now 13-10. First down, King is sacked again. The Alabama pass rushers have a field day. Okori Chibuki is the one with the sack, the young sophomore. Florida State would go on to kick the field goal. They are 3-3 three three on field goals here in the first half as it is a 16-10 lead for the Seminoles. Not a lot of time left here in the first half for Alabama. Only four more seconds. So they're going to have enough time for one more play. Bryson Byrne looks to heave up the Hail Mary downfield, and it is caught at the one by Jaden Wilson-Miller. What could have been for Alabama? That'll bring us to halftime, 16-10, your score. Florida State holds the lead over the Crimson Tide. Let's go to the second half. Alabama with the football, second and nine. Byrne looks to throw it. Going downfield, he connects with Khalil Hassan, the dangerous speedster who is in for a touchdown. Hassan only caught, I think, 12 passes in the regular season, which is just an embarrassment because he's such a talented player. You see, when the ball is in his hands, good things happen. And Alabama takes their first lead of the day, 17-16. Following Alabama possession, here's Bryson Byrne, breaks the sack but is still brought down for a loss of yardage in the backfield. Seattle Jackson brings him down. We haven't said his name a whole lot today because he has been locked down in coverage. Let's move to the fourth quarter. Florida State trailing by one with the ball. King is picked off, and this one is going to go for a pick six. That's the safety, Jason Forte, making a huge play, and Alabama extends their lead. They are now up by eight. Florida State needs a little sense of urgency now. Here's Jacob King with blocks down the field, wrapped up inside the 15. Big run for the Seminoles, who are getting quite close to the end zone. 
Second and nine, time continuing to tick here in the fourth quarter. Man in motion here for Florida State. King under center, taking his time. When is he gonna hike the ball? Finally he does, looking to throw it, and it is caught for a touchdown by Stanley Bentley. That was a very risky throw, and now Florida State's gonna go for two. They would convert, and it is a tie ball game at 24. Alabama has it back. Byrne looks to throw it. He is picked off. Irvin Harris with the interception. He's going to look to take it for a big return past the 30. Both quarterbacks have not done a good job of protecting the football today. I guess that's why these are two run-first teams as Florida State takes the lead off of the touchdown by Brody Kluby. 31-24. Alabama's going to have enough time for one more drive to look to tie the game and bring it to overtime. Second and one here for the Crimson Tide. Handoff for Quincy Murphy. Breaks a tackle. Looking to break another one. He is wrapped up inside the 25. Murphy has not gotten the ball a lot today. Only seven carries, but he has made the most of his opportunities. Fourth and goal now. Game on the line for Alabama. They don't convert. They are going to lose. Emeka Iwuzie, the tight end in motion. Byrne looks to throw it, and he connects for a touchdown. It's Cooper Jensen. And this game is tied up at 31. We are going to overtime. We've got overtime here in the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl as Alabama will choose to start on defense. So we will open up with the Florida State offense. Third and 11. Jacob King looks to throw it. Going for the end zone. It's caught for a touchdown. Connor Roberts mosses Marcus Moore for the score. Florida State leads by seven. The Tide looking to respond, and they do. It's Kyle McCloskey with the touchdown. 38-38. We are going to a second overtime. All right, Alabama opens up with the ball now. Kyle McCloskey scores once again. So the Tide with back-to-back -back touchdowns. Now Florida State needs to respond. It's a fourth and goal. Game on the line here for the Seminoles. Jacob King to throw it, and it is caught for a touchdown by Garrett Rodriguez. Jacob King with a game-tying touchdown. It is now 45-45. We go into the third overtime. Now, if you score a touchdown, you got to go for two. Jacob King on the first play of overtime number three. He is intercepted. Blue jam. The senior corner picks it off. We're giving all this attention to Marcus Moore, and rightly so. But Blue Jam is a fantastic young corner. Alabama looking to finish the game off, and they do. Quincy Murphy with the game-winning touchdown as the University of Alabama wins the Peach Bowl 51-45 in triple overtime. Talk about a start to the New Year's Six Bowl games. A huge win here for Alabama. Bryson Byrne. He had some good moments and he had some bad moments, put it that way. We saw why they're a run-first team. Kyle McCloskey and Quincy Murphy both played out of their minds today. Two of the best running backs in college football. Outside of the Mecca Uwuzie, all of Alabama's offensive skill position players are expected to be back next season. We'll see if that holds to form. As for Florida State, Jacob King, I thought, was pretty solid. 28-34, three touchdowns. He was picked off twice. Brody Kluby, a little bit quiet, but he was still pretty good. Overall, good win here for Alabama. Disappointing end of the season for Florida State, who finishes 11-3. That'll bring us to the Rose Bowl between Notre Dame and Oregon. Oregon was supposed to play Michigan, and Notre Dame was supposed to play Georgia, but since those two teams are in the college football playoff, I'm having these two teams against each other for the Rose Bowl. Notre Dame is one of the hottest teams in the country. They are certainly a run-first team. Quarterback that got Sosa Hupe, who's been pretty disappointing this season when he's been on the field, projected once as a first-round pick. That obviously is not held to form. They are led by their ground game and senior running back, Nate Washington. They've got one of the best defenses in the country as well, led by Adai, Adiwar, Anthony Brooks, and A.J. Brown in the secondary, who has eight interceptions. Oregon is certainly an offensive team, led by sophomore quarterback Barrett Cherokee, one of the most explosive players in college football. Noel Hilaire had a great season on the ground. Tyler Royal at wide receiver is being looked at as a possible first-round pick. And they've got a lot of talent on defense, too. Guys like Lamont Johnson, Cosmo Montgomery, Wallace Lee Anderson, and Alex Weldy lead the Ducks. You may notice Oregon is number three and Notre Dame is number five. That is incorrect. Notre Dame is actually number seven and Oregon is unranked. I had to, ha like, restart the season and had these two teams in the Rose Bowl in a totally different save file. 
So that's why the rankings are off. You may notice the scores on the bottom are off, but the two rosters are exactly the same. It's the best I could do considering NCAA football only is a two-team championship. Oregon opening up with the football, third and 11. Cherokee heaves it up, and it's dropped! Tyler Royal, the first-round projected receiver, had a touchdown right in his hands, but he dropped it. That's seven points off the board. Can't be making those types of mistakes. Ducks have it back. Here's Cherokee on the ground, one of the best rushing quarterbacks in college football. If only Oregon's defense was better, I think Cherokee would be getting more national hype. The Ducks would kick a field goal. They lead 3-0. Notre Dame now with the ball. Short throw to the running back, Nate Washington, who breaks tackles past the 40. Nate Washington is such a good player, man. He has really improved his draft stock this season. Notre Dame would kick a field goal. Now the game is tied at three. Following Oregon possession. Another nice run for Barrett Cherokee. Still on his feet. He will not go down without a fight. What a run by Barrett Cherokee. He gets 23. Couple of plays later, first and ten here for the Ducks, late in the first quarter. Noel Hilaire in motion. Cherokee, the sophomore with a strike to the freshman wideout, Justice Everdeen. The Ducks having another nice little drive here. They have it on the goal line. Can they punch their first touchdown of the day? Third and goal. Cherokee looks to keep it, and he is smothered in the backfield for a loss of yardage. Joe Phillips, maybe not the guy you would expect to make the play, makes the play. So Oregon would kick a field goal. Notre Dame would march all the way down the field slowly but surely as the backup running back, MJ Hill, gets the first touchdown of the afternoon, making it a 10-6 ball game. Oregon has it back, looking to take the lead. What a throw by Cherokee over to Amante Rogers for 32 yards. The Ducks have so many offensive playmakers, one of the highest scoring offenses in the country. And then on first and goal, the junior running back, Noel Hilaire, will punch it in for the score. And the Ducks respond with a touchdown as it's now 13-10. Notre Dame has it back late in the first half. Looking to take the lead here in Pasadena. Sosa Hupe under pressure. Smothered to the ground. He is sacked for a loss of about 10. Big play by the Duck defense. Notre Dame now looking to tie it on a field goal. 57-yard attempt for the Lou Groza Award winner, Adam Jones. His kick is well short. Jones has been the best kicker in college football this season. I was expecting that kick to go in, but it will not fall. Certainly not a great first half offensively for Notre Dame. We'll see if the Ducks can get some points here late in the half with about a minute to go. Second and four, Cherokee goes downfield. What a great throw into the hands of Tyler Royal, who's able to hold on to this one for a gain of 28 yards. That'll lead to the field goal team coming out, looking to double the lead. Kick is up. It is no good. That was a short field goal from like sub 45 yards, and he was short. So both kickers miss a pair of field goals here late in the first half, 13 to 10. Two very high-scoring offenses have played a defensive battle up to this point. Notre Dame played earlier in the season here in Pasadena. They beat USC, although in that game, Sosa Hupe only completed two passes. He was horrible. He's playing better here, but Notre Dame, of course, still led by their ground game, still led by Nate Washington, who gets a nice run past the 50. The Fighting Irish are moving the ball down the field pretty well. They only scored one touchdown in the first half. As on second and nine. It's going to be a screen... For the other running back, MJ Hill, who's probably going to be the starter next year, he gets 17. Notre Dame's moving it well, but they got to convert here on third and 10. Sosa Hupe looks to throw it, has time. Now under pressure, he is sacked. Wallace Lee Anderson brings him down to the turf for his second sack of the game. Notre Dame kicks a field goal to tie the game as we go to the following Fighting Irish possession. Hupe under a lot of pressure. He goes short for Nate Washington, who has blocks, breaks a tackle, and he is in for a touchdown. Nate Washington with the score, and the Fighting Irish now lead 20-13. Good to see Nate Washington making some big plays, as now the Oregon offense has it here late in the third quarter. Third and four, handoff for Noel Hilaire, who breaks a tackle. There goes Hilaire, stiff arms the defender, past the 30. Big play there for the Oregon offense. Hilaire has not gotten the ball a ton, but when he has, he's been pretty good. Fourth and three, later in the drive, now in the fourth quarter, Oregon will elect to go for it. Cherokee keeps it on the read option, cuts to the outside, and he is stopped. Well short of the mark to gain. He got nothing on that play. Big stop for the Notre Dame defense as they have it back on offense. 
Sosa Hupi looks to throw it here on first down. He is sacked again. Wallace, Lee Anderson with his third sack of the game. Now a fourth and 20. Notre Dame chewing clock around 40 seconds to go as Adam Jones goes for the field goal. Doink! Off the crossbar, no good. An unlucky bounce for Adam Jones. And the Ducks are going to get the ball back with no timeouts and around 35 seconds, trailing by four. The Ducks have got to move quick here. Time is winding down. Look at the clock. 20 seconds to go. Cherokee goes short inbounds for a gain of 10, but they don't get the first down. So the clock is going to keep going. They've got to get back to the line of scrimmage, spike the ball, and they're probably going to have enough time for one more play, likely a Hail Mary. All right, with seven seconds, this is pretty much the ball game. Third and inches now for the Oregon Ducks, trailing 16 to 20 here in the Rose Bowl. The Ducks are in Hail Mary formation. They're not going to waste any time. They're going to take a shot for the end zone. Here's Barrett Cherokee going deep. It is caught for a touchdown. The Ducks take the lead with a second to go. Deron Payton puts Oregon ahead. The Ducks perfectly execute the Hail Mary. What a throw from Cherokee. They had all three of their receivers in the exact same spot. If Peyton wasn't going to catch it, one of the other two guys would have instead. The Ducks shock the world in the Rose Bowl. 23-20 over Notre Dame. I was impressed with Sosa Hupi, though. I thought he had a pretty good performance throwing the football. Nate Washington, of course, was very solid. But Notre Dame's offense was just not consistent enough throughout the game. Their defense was pretty good, minus that last play where they completely blew it. But overall, I thought Notre Dame's defense was pretty solid. Adam Jones missed two critical kicks. Again, he was the Groza Award winner. What happened? As for the Ducks, very strong performance from Barrett Cherokee, showing why he's one of the most talented quarterbacks in the country. Tyler Royal, though, possible first-round receiver. Three catches, 45 yards, and five drops. When we talked about him and the prospect profile in the Titan series, the concern I had for Royal is his hands. He's not consistent enough. He drops the easy ones, and he definitely showed that today. The defense was led by Wallace Lee Anderson. Four tackles for loss, three sacks. What a win for the Ducks, who finished their season 8-5. and five. Again, I know it said they were ranked number three. We know that's not actually true. Next up, we've got the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl between the champions of the Big 12, West Virginia, and the champions of the American Athletic Conference, Memphis. West Virginia is led by their offense and junior quarterback Jose Alvaro. The Mountaineers have to feel really disappointed after losing out to Michigan for the final college football playoff spot after beating Michigan and having a pretty similar resume. As for Memphis, their quarterback Cyrus Stedard suffered a season-ending injury halfway through the season. He was replaced by Caleb Custard, who's done a great job. He led Memphis over Navy in the American Athletic Conference Championship game to bring them here to the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl at the University of Phoenix Stadium, home of the Arizona Cardinals. Memphis was not supposed to be here. The American Athletic has like three ranked teams. Memphis is not one of them, but they won the conference and they've earned an opportunity to play in this game. The Tigers with the football. Here's Diamond Beckham, the senior running back, in for a touchdown. I don't think Memphis is going to get blown out at all. I think this is going to be a great game. I think West Virginia is going to look flat. They're going to feel defeated after not making the college football playoff. And that is certainly holding up early in this game. Alvaro is intercepted by the senior cornerback, Harrison Harrington. His seventh interception of the season. Harrington has done a phenomenal job for the Memphis defense. He is definitely going to get drafted this season. Possible gem late in the draft. First and goal here for the Tigers. Handoff for Diamond Beckham. He'll get his second rushing touchdown of the game. And the Tigers are off to a dominant 14-0 start. I told you, West Virginia might look flat and defeated. And I honestly don't blame them. I'd be pretty flat and defeated too after not making the playoff over Michigan. The Mountaineers do finally get a stop as Custard is sacked by Green. So the Mountaineers get it back, first and 10. Alvaro goes short to the running back. J.K. Jordan, who breaks a tackle, he is gone. Breaks two more for a 69. Nice. Yard touchdown, and the Mountaineers are on the board. West Virginia may have came into this game flat, but they're not going to end their season without a fight. They want to prove to the college football committee why they got it wrong However, Memphis would answer right back with a touchdown of their own. 
from Malachi Wilcox, making it 21 to 7. So the Tigers lead by 14 late in the half. West Virginia is going to look to run one more Hail Mary. To end the first half, Alvaro goes deep. It is caught for a touchdown. What is with these Hail Marys? Julian Smith is the one with the grab. And the Mountaineers, despite playing really badly for their standards, are only down by seven going into the second half. We'll see if West Virginia can really look like the better team in half number two and take this one away from the Tigers. West Virginia really hasn't had a sustained drive. Both of their touchdowns have been really long plays. So West Virginia's got to show something here in the third quarter. Big run by Jose Alvaro. He gets 31 yards. Alvaro's built like a tank. He runs like Josh Allen. Maybe not the passer that Josh Allen is, but he runs a lot like him, which is a compliment. First and 15, Alvaro on the slant route. It's caught. That one will go for a touchdown. Leighton Simpson, the star tight end, one of the top projected players at his position in the upcoming draft. Here's the following West Virginia possession. It's the backup running back shrugging defenders in for the score. West Virginia certainly looks like the better team here early in the second half as it's David King with the score, 28-21. Memphis looking to respond late here in the third quarter. Is on first down. Custard keeps it himself. Breaks the tackle. And here goes Caleb Custard on the option past the 40. Custard is a dual threat quarterback. I'm excited to see what he can do as the full-time starter next year for Memphis. Diamond Beckham back in the end zone for another touchdown. Tying the game up here at 28. All right, we're going to skip through pretty much the rest of the fourth quarter. It was pretty much all defense for the most part without any, like, super big defensive plays. West Virginia, their final hope. They're going to go for another Hail Mary, but Alvaro can't get rid of it. He is sacked on the play by Titus Galloway, and we are headed to overtime here in the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl. We've already had one overtime bowl game amongst New Year's Six games. That was, of course, between Alabama and FSU. Ended up going into three overtimes, and Alabama survived. We'll see what happens here as the Mountaineers will start off with the football, and they will look to set the tone here in overtime number one. First play from scrimmage. Alvaro looking to throw it under some pressure, and he's picked off. Harrison Harrington again. His second interception at the ball game, his eighth of the season, and Harrington might have just won the game for the Memphis Tigers. A huge play by the senior corner jumping the route. Harrington has been fantastic all day. He's shut down the number one receiver, Lamar Rodgers, and he has two interceptions, including probably the game winner. Memphis just needs one more touchdown to finish this one off, and they're going to do just that. Diamond Beckham rumbling, tumbling, stumbling for the game-winning touchdown as the Tigers upset the West Virginia Mountaineers here in the Fiesta Bowl. They win at 34-28. Great win for the Memphis program. Great season for the Tigers who win their conference championship and the Fiesta Bowl. Caleb Custard was pretty solid, but Diamond Beckham was the star of the show. 226 yards and four touchdowns. My God, was he good. You know who else was really good today? Harrison Harrington. He's a stud. Certainly a guy who improved his draft stock in this bowl game. Jose Alvaro was solid. Not great. Not bad either. Again, it just felt like West Virginia's effort and intensity wasn't really there. And again, I don't entirely blame them. I understand why they'd be a little bit rattled after not getting into the playoff instead of Michigan. Next up, we've got the Discover Orange Bowl between the ACC champion Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets and the 8-4 Arkansas Razorbacks. So Arkansas is an interesting case. They're number six. I don't know how they're over teams like Oklahoma, but okay, that's neither here nor there. I do think Arkansas is a really good football team, though, led by Jackson Kayuma at quarterback, the senior. He had a very good season at running back. Cannon McMullen started the season off as a backup, ended up as a Heisman contender with over 2,000 yards and 16 touchdowns. The starting running back, Jeremy Martindale, is healthy for this game, so I'm curious to see how Arkansas will use Martindale and McMullen together in the backfield. Although Arkansas lost four games, I can understand why they're in the top 10. They're red hot. They've got a great run game. They've got a phenomenal secondary with Brad Belliford, Brent Belliford, and Giddy Johnson. As for Georgia Tech, they had no expectations going into the season, but Garrett Pace, the senior quarterback, had a great season, leading them to the ACC title. Jordan Brown, their backup running back, was great as well after their starter, Micah Adams Jr., got injured. These guys also have a great defense, led by Ellis Urmarn and his nine interceptions. 
the senior corner, had a great season for the Yellow Jackets, leading them to the ACC Championship and the Orange Bowl. If Georgia Tech beat Georgia in the final regular season game of the season, I think Georgia Tech would be in the college football playoff right now. And they took Georgia to overtime, barely losing that matchup. So Georgia Tech would get the ball first. They would bring it all the way to the one-yard line. However, on first and goal, Garrett Pace would be sacked by Kevin James, the big defensive lineman making the play. Third and goal now for the Yellow Jackets, looking to punch it in and strike first against the Razorbacks as it's the fullback, James Smith, with the score. Not Garrett Pace, not Jordan Brown, not Micah Adams. It's James Smith with Georgia Tech's first touchdown of the day. Following Georgia Tech possession, here's Pace. He goes back to the fullback, breaking tackles. What a play for James Smith. He gets 27. So far, Smith has been the star of the show for the Georgia Tech offense. The Yellow Jackets going with a quick, no-huddle-paced offense. It's worked for them all season. Third and goal, the senior Micah Adams breaks the tackle. He is in for the score. So Micah Adams was their lead runner going into the season. He got injured. Jordan Brown was the backup. He was great. Adams has played a couple of games since, and Georgia Tech has done a good job of using both running backs. However, Jordan Brown fumbles it here. It's picked up by the Razorbacks, and it'll go for a touchdown. Robert Prince with the scoop and score, and the Arkansas is on the board late in the first quarter. They are back in the ballgame. Following Arkansas possession, their offense has not done a whole lot today as Cayuma loses it. He tried to pitch it out to Jeremy Martindale, who's able to scoop it up, but he loses nine. The Georgia Tech defense has been ruthless so far in this game as we transition quarters. Arkansas looking to kick a long field goal. This one from 57. It is up and it is well short. No good. Arkansas has yet to score in any of their offensive possessions today as it remains 14-7. Third and 11. Pace looking to throw it. Breaks the tackle and his pass is intercepted. Dustin Brown with the interception. Maybe not the guy you expect to make the play in the Arkansas secondary. They're going to have three defensive backs drafted this year. Dustin Brown not one of them, mainly because he's not draft eligible. Arkansas would move it all the way down the field looking to score their first offensive points of the day. And it looks like they will. Jeremy Martindale with the touchdown. Arkansas feels kind of loyal to Martindale. Even with how good Cannon McMullen was, Martindale's gotten a bulk of the carries in the backfield. Jackson Kayuma here keeps it on the read option. Breaking tackles. Breaks another one. Kayuma with another broken tackle. He gains 40, doubling his rushing yards total for the day. Big run there for Arkansas. Kayuma's been the lead runner, honestly, over both Martindale and McMullen. The Razorbacks would kick a late field goal. They've scored 17 unanswered points as it is now 14-17. Georgia Tech has it late in the first half. Garrett Pace looks to throw it and he is intercepted again. The third turnover here in the first half for the Arkansas defense and Arkansas has quickly stolen all the momentum. Shannon Green with the interception. Again, maybe not the guy you expect to really make the play there. Third and 10 here for Arkansas. Kayuma looks to throw it under pressure, and he is sacked. McKinley Carrington in the backfield. The senior defensive lineman makes the play, and Arkansas would miss their following field goal attempt. 17-14 going into the halftime break. The Razorbacks lead. Into the third quarter, third and one. Big run here for Garrett Pace with room, and he will be brought down inside the 10 by Brad Belliford and Giddy Johnson. A big run there by Pace, who has Georgia Tech pretty close to the end zone. Second and goal. Pace rolls out to the right, and he is untouched for six. Georgia Tech back on the board, and with a field goal on the following possession, they are now up 24-17 here in the fourth quarter. Kayuma on third and nine, goes for the end zone, and he is picked off. A big play by the Georgia Tech secondary, as that one was grabbed by one of the safeties. So the Yellow Jackets now feel like they had the momentum. They're in a pretty good spot, up by seven, with the football, looking to chew some clock and add another touchdown to ice the game. Pace downfield. It's caught by the true freshman, Rowan Tanabe, who gets it to the 20. Big play there for Tanabe, who's had a few nice catches in this game. Georgia Tech continuing to move quickly to the line of scrimmage as their fast-paced style of play is really starting to wear down the Arkansas defense. Third and one here for the Yellow Jackets. Pace looks to get the first down. Late pitch. 
is hauled in by Jordan Brown, and he is in for the score. Great high IQ play there by Garrett Pace, and Georgia Tech is in the driver's seat. They lead 31-17. Arkansas looking for what would be nothing short of the miracle. Arkansas has it in the red zone. Their offense is doing their job so far as Kayuma will go in the back of the end zone, connecting with Kyle Kebitz for the touchdown. It's now 31-24. Arkansas is going to need to recover the onside kick, and it is recovered by Arkansas. Okay, this just got interesting. But there's one problem. On the previous touchdown, Jackson Kayuma strained his pack. So he is not on the field at quarterback. J.R. Garcia is in at QB for the Razorbacks as he is intercepted here on 3rd and 15. He was under a lot of pressure. He kind of heaved it up and gets picked off by the junior linebacker, Jason Gatewood. So Georgia Tech, all they got to do is choose some clock. They should be able to finish out this game. No problem off of the big takeaway by Gatewood, who could be a high draft pick next year. Third and one. This is it. Pace loses it on the option fumble. And it's picked up by Arkansas. Guido Lekovici recovers it. And Arkansas is going to have another shot. Quarterback Jackson Kayuma will return to the game. We'll see if they can score. Clock is ticking. Under 30 to go on first down. Kayuma sacked. On the play for a loss of eight. He was wrapped up by McKinley Carrington. His second sack of the ball game. Third and 18 with 13 seconds left to go. Jackson Kayuma looking for the sidelines. It is caught out of bounds. Good reception there by Connor Johnson. Now there's four seconds left. Second and 10. This is it. Game on the line. Kayuma for the end zone. Touchdown! Brandon Triplett with the score. With triple zeros on the clock. And all Arkansas needs is an extra point to tie it. And they do. So we have had four New Year's Six Bowl games so far. And three of them have now gone into overtime. I think my sliders might be working a little bit too well. So we will hop into overtime number one. Georgia Tech knows tails never fails. Except for this time. Arkansas will choose to start on defense. So the Yellow Jackets will open up on offense. First and goal here for Georgia Tech. Their offense looks good here on this opening overtime possession as they will add the touchdown. It's Lance Blake, the receiver, lining out in the backfield. So Georgia Tech does their job. They score the touchdown. We'll see if Arkansas can respond. Third and goal. Kayuma looks to throw it, and it is caught for a score by Cannon McMullen. Where has he been all day? McMullen has done virtually nothing in this game, yet Arkansas has been able to hang around. The Razorbacks now in overtime number two start with the ball. Kayuma on the slant route. It's caught by Kyle Kebitz. His second touchdown late in the game. 45-38. Georgia Tech's backs are against the wall. It's fourth and nine. This is it. Pace looking to throw it under pressure. Caught. Touchdown by the true freshman Rowan Tanabe. What a catch by Tanabe who is going to be Georgia Tech's starting quarterback next year. Yes, you heard me right. He is their QB next year but he's so athletic he's getting big time snaps at receiver making big time plays that play is like a passing of the torch from the current starting quarterback to the future one garrett pace and the offense gets stopped in overtime number three so they'll have to kick a field goal and now all arkansas needs to do is punch in for a touchdown and they can win the discover orange bowl first play for the razorbacks kayuma is sacked Huge play for the Georgia Tech defense. James Gant with his second sack of the game. Arkansas would do nothing after that. The field goal unit is back. 50-yard field goal attempt to tie the game and bring it to a fourth overtime. The kick is barely good. 48-48 into overtime. Numero quattro. This game seems like it will never end. So Arkansas will again start with the football. Again, now that we've passed the third overtime, if you score a touchdown, you got to go for two. Third and 12, Kayuma looks for the end zone. It is intercepted by the Georgia Tech defense. A huge takeaway for the Yellow Jackets in the back of the end zone. It's McPherson who picks him off. Now Georgia Tech just has to score to win this game. Second and goal at the one. Garrett Pace scrambles in for the touchdown. And Georgia Tech in unbelievable fashion wins the Discover Orange Bowl in four overtimes. 
Garrett Pace's final collegiate snap is a game-winning touchdown. What a game. This has to be the game of the season so far. Not just the best bowl game, but the best game of this whole friggin' season. Jackson Kayuma was very solid, 25-45, four touchdowns. Cannon McMullen, five carries, eight yards. He did catch 11 passes. But still, I don't know why they didn't use McMullen more. With Jeremy Martindale graduating, McMullen will be the unquestioned starter going into the next season. Although I would think 2,000 rushing yards would be unquestioned enough. Overall, good game here by Arkansas. They gave it everything they got. It really felt like Arkansas had chances to win and they capitalized on every opportunity except for that last overtime. Garrett Pace, I thought, had a great performance. He was picked off twice in the first half, but Pace had a gutsy performance late in this game. Adams was good. Brown was good. Everybody who got a carry for Georgia Tech scored a rushing touchdown. Jordan Brown was good in the air. Rowan Tanabe, the starting quarterback for Georgia Tech next year, was fantastic as well. He played a little wide receiver in high school. That's how he got these snaps and obviously took advantage of them. So a great win for Georgia Tech. Again, this program had no expectations going into the season. They won the ACC, and they won the Orange Bowl. That's pretty damn cool. The final New Year's Six Bowl game of the day is the Cotton Bowl between Kentucky and the University of Central Florida. These two teams were not expected to be playing in January going into the season, but here we are. Kentucky went 9-3 in a loaded SEC, led by quarterback Isaiah Gordon and running back Benny Dixon. The Wildcats have plenty of talent on the defensive side of the ball as well, along with a couple of receivers. Kentucky may have not had the flashiest season, but they're a damn good football team finishing second in the SEC East, only behind Georgia. As for UCF, in their first season in the Big 12, led by senior QB Bay Morant and sophomore running back Givian Atwater. The star of the show really was Jensen Young, who was a Boletnikoff Award finalist, grabbing 1,400 yards and 14 touchdowns in the air. The other teams who joined the Big 12 this year, Cincinnati, Houston, and BYU, all finished under 500, yet you have UCF playing in a New Year's Six Bowl game. We are at AT&T Stadium, Jerry's World, home of the Dallas Cowboys and the Cotton Bowl between Kentucky and UCF. Kentucky with the ball, third and two. Isaiah Gordon with a great throw, caught by the tight end, Ali Daniels, and he is in for the touchdown. So Kentucky is on the board, first 6 nothing. Here's the UCF offense, Bay Morant looking to run with it. He's another guy who's a super tough, physical runner. Kind of like Jose Alvaro, he runs a lot like Josh Allen. Fourth and one, UCF looking to go for it here. Morant looking for the end zone, broken up by Landon Ashby. I think UCF should have just gone for a short run there. Get the ball to Gideon Atwater, get him a couple yards, and reset the chains. Following UCF possession, another nice run here by Bay Morant, who has looked good on the ground. Morant has had a very good senior season at quarterback for the Knights, and they'll be able to kick a late quarter field goal, making it a 7-3 ball game. They did not want to go for it on fourth and goal. I don't blame them because they didn't convert last time. Kentucky's going to add a touchdown here late in the first quarter. Isaiah Gordon on the read option. The Wildcats look good early. They lead this one 14-3. Let's go into the second quarter following Kentucky possession. All the New Year's Six Bowl games have been super close. This one could be turning into a blowout. Look at Benny Dixon. But 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 Benny with the Jets all the way to the one-yard line. A huge gain by Gordon. First and goal now for the Wildcats. Another read option, and Isaiah Gordon is in for his third all-purpose touchdown of the game. I think Isaiah Gordon's one of the most underrated quarterbacks in college football. It's 21-3. UCF is going to need to answer, and that's a good start. Jameer Kafili, the true freshman wideout with the touchdown. Kafili finished second on the team in yards this season, only behind, obviously, Jensen Young. 21-10 here, second and two for the Kentucky. But 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 Benny and the Jets once again, all the way down to the 23-yard line. What a start here for Benny Dixon. He looks great in this first half for Kentucky. They would tack on a field goal now, 24-10. Following Kentucky possession, here's Isaiah Gordon looking to throw in, and he is intercepted. A huge takeaway for the UCF defense, and they're going to try to get back into this game here with the turnover, it's Jason Clifford who makes the play. So UCF currently trails by 14. We'll see if they can maybe make it a one-score game here going into halftime. First and 10. 
Morant with a strike downfield. It's caught. Broking tackles. It's Marcus Powell with the touchdown. And although UCF struggled early, don't look now, but the Knights are back in the ballgame. 24-17. And to make matters worse for Kentucky, quarterback Isaiah Gordon is out for the game with an injury. So it'll be senior Caleb Scott in at the position for the rest of the ball game. Scott is sacked here on third and 13. Ronald Stevens in the backfield with a huge defensive play. UCF has it back, still 24-17. We'll see what they can do here on this early possession in the third quarter. It's a handoff for Givian Atwater with blocks down the field. Can he go all the way? Not quite. He does bring it to the red zone, wrapped up by the defensive end, Jair Savage. UCF would kick a field goal, now 24-20 as Kentucky has it back. Second and 11. Scott on the screen, and Dixon loses four. The UCF defense looks great here in the second half as Kentucky would have to kick a field goal. Into the fourth quarter, the Wildcats double their lead. Caleb Scott scores the touchdown on the read option, making it 34-20. to UCF trails once again by 14. They've got to move quickly here. Third and one for the Knights. Morant with a pitch for Atwater, who breaks a couple more tackles. Another huge run for Givian Atwater. Unable to burn the Jets late, but he does get 30. UCF's got to move quickly here. First and goal for Central Florida. Bay Morant keeps it on the read option. Blows by the defender. He is in for the score. And UCF makes it a one-possession game, 34-27. Kentucky has the ball back. Four and a half to go. Third and 13. Scott with a strike downfield for Cassius Morris. And he is gone. A huge 80-yard touchdown for the Kentucky Wildcats. Out of the lawn with a field goal. And it is a 17-point lead for Kentucky. UCF has it late. Moran on first down goes deep and he connects with Jensen Young who will take it all the way. Jensen Young's been surprisingly quiet in this game. He does get a late touchdown here, but it's not going to make the difference as the Kentucky Wildcats take home the Cotton Bowl. Overall, the SEC unsurprisingly looked really good here in bowl season, taking home a bunch of the New Year's Six Bowls. Alabama won the Peach Bowl. Arkansas nearly won the Orange Bowl. Kentucky is able to take home the Cotton Bowl. Can Georgia take home the playoff? I don't know. We'll see. UCF gave a good fight. Overall, I think this was a really successful season for Central Florida. It's a shame they kind of fell off late after they started red hot. But overall, considering the other Big 12 or the new Big 12 teams really struggled, UCF has to feel very optimistic going forward. Isaiah Gordon had a great game for Kentucky before getting hurt. It's a shame he got injured. I would have loved to have seen another half of football from him. All right, that'll wrap up all of the non-college football playoff ball games. We've only got three more games left to go in this season. South Alabama taking on Michigan. Middle Tennessee State taking on Georgia. And then, of course, the national championship game. All of that will be in the next episode as we cover the college football playoff. We will have our first national champion of the series in the next episode. It should be a lot of fun. So that'll wrap this one up. This was a long one to make, going over every single bowl game, but it was a very fun one as well. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out.